I'm going to do one more message on kind of in a group of roles that people who are claiming the name of Jesus Christ without understanding how severe it is can end up becoming a missionary for the devil against the work of God. So I want to bring clarity to another way that that happens a lot so that people will know that they have a choice to make. They can either continue on in this same way or they can repent and become a missionary for Jesus Christ rather than a battering ram that the enemy uses against the missionaries of Jesus Christ. So Charles Russell is a Christian writer and he says, it is the church that is especially instructed to speak evil of no man. Of course, it is natural for our fallen flesh to dodge nearly everything and to try to think out some way by which we could justify ourselves in saying something unfavorable of another. And it seems that even the Lord's people have often edged around to see what excuse they can find for speaking evil and yet not feel condemned. So one of the reasons that we tend to try to justify speaking wrongly of another believer is obviously to boost our own ego and to help us eliminate guilty feelings in ourselves of our offense towards them. We want to do better, be better, yet we keep failing. We don't like the feelings of guilt that come over us, so we watch for the failings and weaknesses of others, and when one appears, we jump on it. We like to call attention to them and to others, obviously pointing out the mistakes or weaknesses while ignoring that oftentimes the things that we point out and call out in others are the very same weaknesses and faults and sins that we have ourselves. We may not even see it, but everyone else can see it. We want others to see that we are holy, but instead we're exposing that we're hypocritical, deceptive, and displeasing to God. That's what that actually shows to everyone else. Even to brand new believers and even to people who aren't believers at all, they see that kind of behavior as hypocritical, deceptive, displeasing to God and makes them want no part of Christianity. That one reason is a huge reason why many will reject Christ. To claim that fault finding is prompted by love over our hatred of sin and our desire for righteousness is completely deceptive and hypocritical. Matthew 7, 3 clearly shows, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And the worst aspect of fault finding is the way in which it's often done, which is often sharp. It's a demeaning um, style of communicating. However, it is a very big mistake to think that because the evil words, are, if they were said in a kind and gentle manner, would make it good, that it would show that a pure heart is being used that is full of love. We all know Satan is continually presenting himself and the way he works as light. So he can cause us to talk very softly, very kindly and seemingly very lovingly and utter the same words. And we'll think it looks godly, we'll think it looks holy and we will be speaking evil against those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Satan will not oppose our salvation, but he will work to enlist us to work in his army against the Christians who are serving Jesus. That's an ultimate act of revenge on his part is to take those who name Jesus and pull them over to work for himself against those who really do follow Jesus. Those who plant evil thoughts to show sin of others and in a truth implying manner, even done possibly with tears, are the most dangerous enemies of the work of God on earth and often accomplish great harm to those who work diligently to save others from hell. They plant roots of bitterness, thoughts of evil in hearts who would reject the very same things if presented in a harsh and offensive manner. So if someone else came and said it who wasn't 
working inside of a church or a ministry, people would automatically know that it was completely gossip and mean. But the position that people have when they're working in ministry or inside a church, and then they use this saying they heard from the Lord or they're protecting the church or protecting the ministry, it gives them credibility when they're in a position that names Christ. What happens is the devil has an effective worker against Jesus and his people. That's what happens. If we know a follower of Christ who has slipped and stumbled in their walk, the urge will come to call others' attention to it. That needs to be stopped immediately. Proverbs 11:13 says, A talebearer reveals secrets, but he that is a faithful spirit conceals the matter. Only go to the one person, offer to help them, to lift them up, to encourage them, to help them understand repentance. In most cases, this person is already going to be sad, remorseful, feeling guilty and heavy because they have failed. There is no need for someone naming Jesus to come along with a verbal microphone and announce it to the world. That's the enemy. The Bible gives us a proper procedure to follow when we have been wrong personally by this behavior. Speak no criticism to another soul, but go to the person we feel has wronged us. A true Christian will work hard to develop character that speaks well of others. Go to the person alone if you have anything unpleasant to say about them or Jesus. That's your choices. Christians know God and his character. But somehow they forget the fact that he sees this kind of behavior as hateful and equates it to murder. He equates slander as, in, as assassination and the destruction of a good name as robbery. And any of these choices from especially those who claim the name of Jesus is doubly evil, the robbery or the murder of a brother, according to 1 John 3.15. And once fault finding is started, it spreads like a wildfire. One slip of our tongue can easily destroy the reputation of another. The person who does it is going to be held accountable for the murder of that person's ministry, their name, whatever is destroyed. They will be held accountable. Paul gave good advice to those who were criticizing each other over food in Romans 14, 13, and 19 through 20. He said, let us stop turning critical eyes on one another. If we must be critical, let us be critical of our own conduct and see that we do nothing to make a brother stumble or fall. Let us pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. So in other words, do not tear down the work of God for anything that in the light of eternity will be found insignificant. So when you're looking at people spending forever in heaven or hell, if it's not a big deal compared to that, let it go. It is much more becoming and profitable for our spirit to look for and call attention to the lovely and amazing qualities of other people. Matthew 7, 2 says, Pass no judgment, you will not be judged. For as you judge others, so will you yourself be judged. And whatsoever measure you deal out to others, that is how it will be dealt back to you. James 2, 12 and 13 says, Always speak and act as men who are to be judged under a law of freedom. In that judgment, there will be no mercy for the man who has shown no mercy. If one occasion someone steps on our foot, may we be quick to forgive when we see the first impulse of that person is repentance. So watch for that. If the person is sorry and wants to repent, quickly go that way with it. Don't start any battle over something when a person is remorseful and wanting to repent. If they are not, and you speak to them privately, the Bible also deals with how to cover that behavior. When we find our thoughts beginning as criticism, we need to crush it and ignore it and change the subject before it reaches our mouth. Force your mind to think instead on things that are pure, lovely, honest, virtuous, and praiseworthy, 
all the blessings that we have to be thankful for, of which there are many. Um, one of the young ladies that was here earlier tonight in her sober house, they have not had hot water for a week. And she was talking about how washing her hands in warm water was something she took for granted. Now she has to wash her hands in cold water with soap and she says it's so different when you have no cold water or no hot water or warm water it's amazing how much you realize how good you have it when you don't even have warm water dr robert hale said they found in long-term studies of both men and women that those who complain a lot and have a negative attitude toward life have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and heart attacks before the age of 60. Those who complain a lot are also a hazard to others. People often avoid them because they like to find fault. We may have to admit that this fault-finding demon is very common amongst believers. We're quick to criticize others for something they did or said without considering the cause of it or the context of it. Sometimes when a person tries to correct us in order to help us improve or grow spiritually, we misjudge their motives we think that they've turned against us. We start talking poorly about them and we make judgments about them to others. I'm going to use information written by Dr. Steven Reiser. He writes on this subject so well, I'm going to use information from him to best show the traits of this dangerous spirit. He writes, a critical spirit is an obsessive attitude of criticism and fault finding, which seeks to tear down rather than build up. Destructive criticism is different from constructive, criti constructive feedback. The only criticism that is ever constructive is that which speaks the truth in love to build up or edify another person for his or her good and for the glory of God. A critical spirit dwells on the negative, looks for flaws rather than positive qualities in others. They are constantly complaining or criticizing and usually upset with something or somebody. They often have little control over their tongue, their temper, and have tendencies for gossip, slander, strife, and malice. And these are some of the sins spoken of by Paul in Romans 1, 29 to 32, where he says, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil and they disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. They know the truth, but they refuse to do it. And they think that it won't result in death. When if someone was doing it to them, they would agree that it should result in death and that it should be stopped and that they aren't even a Christian, but they don't see it the same when it's them doing it. Many who have this poisonous character quality explain it by saying something like this. I'm just using discernment. I'm just being honest. I'm telling it like it is. This person is showing they dwell on the negative, thinking about how bad or wrong something or someone is and this negativity found its way to their tongue, out their mouth, but other times it just stays in their hearts. It stays hidden. Either way, the root sin of this critical spirit is the same. A critical spirit can be very damaging to a person's personal faith and to the health and life of their family and friends. It completely just tanks a house. Anybody who lives with someone who's this way is the whole house, the atmosphere reflects it. If left unchecked, it will stop the holder of this spirit from seeing, appreciating, and enjoying all that's truly good in this world, all that God is doing on this earth. A critical spirit sees everything in life through a dark, drab lens. The critical person comes to expect, even to hope, that everything will have something wrong with it. A critical spirit will assume the role of the devil's advocate, marked by their need for negativity. They hurt themselves and they hurt many others and they work against God. There are four types of critical spirits. One is the gossiper. A gossiper is one who reveals secrets going on 
about as a talebearer or a scandal monger, according to the Bible. They have privileged information about people and they choose to reveal that information to others with sinful motives without their knowledge or approval. Gossipers attempt to make themselves significant to the hearer by appearing to be the source of all knowledge. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.13, at the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also as gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. Proverbs 11:13 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. Proverbs 20:19 says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a gossip. Number two is a slanderer. A slanderer is a person who makes false statements in order to damage a person's reputation. They do not care about the truth. They do not even care to correct the error. You can prove that they are lying. They do not care. That is not the point of what they're doing. They don't care that someone lied about you to them and they repeated it. They don't even care about the truth. They just care to harm you. A slanderer creates error in order to inflict harm. That's the only thing they care about. And the Bible says in Proverbs 10:18. He who conceals hatred has lying lips. He who spreads slander is a fool. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. 1 Peter 2, 1, Therefore put aside all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. The third person of this type is the judgmental person. They have an excessively critical point of view characterized by their tendency to judge harshly. They lack empathy for others' viewpoint because they believe their point of view is the only and the right one. They believe they have the ability, ability to know and see others' motives. They have the amazing skill to point out others' mistakes, all the while minimizing their own. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 1 to 2, do not judge so that you will not be judged for in the way you judge you will be judged by your standard of measure it will be measured to you james 2 13 for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy mercy triumphs over judgment for the complainer is a person who's habitually habitually negative about others and circumstances of life they're characterized by discontent discontentment and ingratitude and the Bible says in James 5, 9, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. And this is why only two of all of the Israelites made it into the promised land. It was complaining that caused God to wipe them out. He was sick of their complaining. He has not changed. He still hates complaining. We don't deserve anything but hell. We should all be just marveling at how amazing life is when that is where we deserve to be. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. The motives behind a critical spirit are varied and this spirit comes from within the heart of a person mark 7 says that sins such as evil thoughts coveting deceit envy and slander proceed from within a person there are several factors that contribute to the development of this critical spirit in someone one self this includes jealousy or envy vengeance anger hatred holding grudges for the purpose of personal gain by destroying another person. Two, fear. This involves feeling threatened by someone or feeling anxiety towards someone, which produces a critical spirit as a way of self-protection. Three, control. This is feeling out of control and it uses manipulation and shaming to get someone under control. Our sinful nature also referred to as the flesh. This critical person is walking around in the flesh, not the spirit. They're drawing on, rather than drawing on God for strength and perspective, they rely on their own resources. This cynicism blocks faith, quenches the spirit of God, causing us to live based on negative feelings, not faith. And godly people will always be optimistic. They're going to be full of hope because they know love, 
They serve a good, great, and gracious God, and they always know that, so they will be optimistic people. That's the true God people. On the other hand, the outlook of the sinful nature or the flesh will have a negative input on most things, one of despair apart from Christ because they have no realistic basis for hope. So out of the heart, the mouth speaks. The overflow of the heart is what comes out the mouth. And you can listen to a person for five minutes and you can tell who is Lord of their life. And I don't care what profession they make out their mouth, their profession will show who lives in their heart. The fruit does not lie. I could say all day long that I'm the Queen of England, but I'm not the Queen of England. And my life will show I'm not the Queen of England. It goes the same way with any other position, not just us as believers. The evidence shows which kingdom you belong to. And if you're constantly complaining and negative and cutting down people, I would examine my salvation while I had the chance. I would surrender to Jesus and get away from the enemy. A poor self-concept is another way, the hurting people hurt people concept. And while this is true, it is no excuse to take on this behavior. When you meet people who are constantly critical, you can be pretty sure they're suffering from some poor self-esteem, but also a works-based self-concept. They are not seeing themselves through the eyes of Christ. Again, they're viewing themselves through the flesh. They see themselves as not pretty, failing, unworthy. They may even condemn themselves. Finding faults keeps us from seeing, feeling, and dealing with our own pain and our own sinful character. Again, surrendering to Jesus allows you to see through his lens, which completely changes our value and the value of others. And that is reflected by what comes out of our mouth. Another is little or no grace. A critical person has experienced little or no grace from God, and it's far easier to see other sins than our own in that case. Judgmental people rarely get in touch with God's perspective on their own failures or even God's incredible gift of forgiveness. Sadly, we are all Pharisees at heart, and that is a sad truth. This is as much for me as anyone else because these things are all part of things I have dealt with over and over and stay pretty connected to the need to repent for many of the things I have addressed in the last few weeks. When you see the sins of others, are you aware that you are just as capable of the very things they do and worse, if God chose to withdraw his grace from you, what would happen to you? If you do not repent of this, he will be forced to do exactly that. He will withdraw his grace from you. It's just like the, the man who was forgiven the great debt and then went out and threatened to throw his friend in prison if he didn't pay his smaller debt. That's from God. He's the one who wrote that story if we do not treat others with grace, he will withhold. For pessimism or negativity, a negative emotional focus, a bad attitude, or a negative, cynical, secular view of life, it's a, from a worldly person. This is not a Jesus follower. A negative person may have unconfessed sin in their life that has separated them. It seems that no matter what opinion you ha they, that you have, they're going to take the opposite opinion and argue with you. The devil gives us enough problems. We certainly don't need to have anyone operating for him from the side that calls themselves believers and certainly don't become one. Insecurity. Criticism is often a conscious or subconscious means to elevate one's own self-esteem or image. And by putting others down, they inwardly are trying to build themselves by feeling more important or appearing more knowledgeable. They want to win this competition. Envy of good fortune of others is often the cause of a critical attitude. People are simply jealous of people's positions, people's uh, possessions, people's relationships. And those of us in ministry are often just as guilty of this as well. We need to learn to rejoice with those who rejoice and be happy for the good fortune of others. That's what Jesus does. 
Another is immaturity. Christians must always keep their focus on Jesus Christ and his word. Our faith is rooted in those things, not on others who are obviously going to disappoint us. Immature Christians or believers haven't progressed far enough in their faith that they are often dependent upon the faith or what they see in other Christians. And unfortunately, when they begin to notice flaws or shortcomings in others, this becomes a threat to their own faith and walk. And oftentimes people will abandon that kind of surface faith because of what a Christian does to them in their faith and walk, when it should drive us to the actual Savior and away from depending on people who will always fail us. Criticism becomes a reaction to their disappointment because their unrealistic expectations in others have been crushed. It is never okay to expect a Christian to be Jesus in your life. In that case, you have made the mistake. You need to be discipled so that Jesus is your focus, not other people. Also, an unrenewed mind. Put down making fun of, criticizing others, and sarcasm. That's how the world reacts to the faults of others. However, as Christians, we should never behave this way. Paul says that our thinking and attitude should be regularly renewed by God's word, which teaches us to bear the infirmities of the weak, to love, to show compassion, and offer encouragement. Romans 12, 2. Another is a root of bitterness. It develops when we fail to obtain the grace of God to forgive others. And when we fail to forgive others, we become angry, bitter, and resentful, not better. Hebrews 12, 15 says, look after each other so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. These people develop a negative emotional focus by harboring bitterness or resentment towards others who have offended them. We were talking earlier that this is the root of a lot of chronic addiction. This type of deep-seated resentment that you feel entitled to or you don't want to expose is fertile ground for sin, addiction, and idolatry. In order for you to get free, you're going to have to forgive. Our ability to live happy, healthy, harmonious lives is largely related to our willingness and ability to consistently forgive and ask for forgiveness. Another is bad company. The reality is, for better or worse, we become like those who we hang around with. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, we should not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals or corrupts good character. I've said it before. I, this, is, this is an area of weakness for me, which is why I'm very careful who I spend a lot of time around. If you're basically a positive person and you associate with a lot of negative people and you're not influencing them to become positive, they will influence you and pull you down into the negativity. This is not a neutral walk. Both sides are mission fields. Jesus or the devil, you get to choose. Which one will you serve? And the company you keep will show clearly which one that is. The devil specializes in influencing negative, obsessive, sinful attitudes and behavior. He will also use many factors and techniques to influence a complaining or critical attitude, stir up turmoil within the body of Christ. We have to be on guard that we are not the tool that Satan uses to discourage or tear down others with criticism. Ephesians 4.27, Paul warns us not to give the devil an opportunity to be used by him. Generally, that happens with the mouth. It also happens sexually. Never allow yourself to be a tool for the devil against someone who wants Jesus. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. In Re Revelation 12, 10, do not allow Satan to use you. To overcome a critical spirit, we have to ditch fake smiles, repressed anger, a lot of Christianese, Christianese being the way that we talk when we're around Christians that we don't talk like when we're in our homes with our families. 
None of those things build the kingdom. They offend God. They actually offend a lot of people too. Sin needs to be first confronted and then defeated. Jesus said we need to take the log out of our own eye before we can see clearly enough to take the splinter out of another's eye. And critical people are often misusing the gift of discernment that was given to them for good reasons. And if you have that gift, be grateful to God, but don't use it to abuse people by judging, condemning, and constantly criticizing people. Make sure before you step out into a mission, focus with that gift, that you are walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you have no position to use it. You need to work on your own life first and get your own life surrendered. So if the devil were to choose to take shots at you, there's no way for them to get in. Here are just a few things a critical person needs to make happen in their life. We need to take our spiritual eyes They need to be open completely to the side of the spirit realm because if we constantly look at this world as if it's our home, as if it's our future, as if it's our life, as if it's our only, we're never going to get this right. The depth of our own sin and the greater depth of God's grace towards us in Christ, we absolutely have to be able to see those things. God must give us this spiritual sight because we will never see them on our own. But he says, ask. That's all we have to do is ask and he will give it. We need to experience the depth of our own sin. We need to get it before we can be useful to him. Otherwise, we're just going to batter people with religion, which is against God. It killed Jesus. James 4, 9 through 10 says, Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and sincere grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Then when you realize your worthlessness before the Lord, he will lift you up, encourage you, and help you. So the more we experience God's grace, the more grateful we are, and the more we're motivated to extend grace to others by being gracious and forgiving. There needs to be a responsibility for those of us who are out here serving in the kingdom that you look at, if someone is a fairly new believer, they just come to Christ in the last few years, that you treat them with dignity and respect and you don't mercilessly hold them to a standard of some of us who have been walking this thing for 30 years because you can destroy them, you can break their spirit, you can leave them so crushed they cannot get back up. They will fall back into the enemy's hands so quickly. And the Bible says what Jesus will do to those who hurt those, to hurt those young ones, he is going to be, it's going to be a terrible price to pay. So if someone is a new believer and you want to use them to govern areas that are difficult and then they aren't able to do it because they're not strong enough, they're not healed enough, they're not steady enough, they haven't built in the right structure, they don't have a sustained walk that is stable enough to carry a hard work of responsibility. And then they end up beat up and crushed by the enemy, exhausted, um, possibly relapsing in despair. The responsibility of that falls on the one who put them in that position. There is no need to put brand new Christians in these big roles where they absolutely get spun out, tore up, and then you turn on them, the one who put them in that role. They get abandoned by them because they didn't measure up. There is very little that's as reprehensible to who God is than that. And it happens in a lot of ministries. I would say, handle your new believers with great grace. Spend a great amount of time discipling them, showing them how to walk with Christ, showing them how to operate in their giftings, all the many things discipleship does. Jesus walked with his for three years, day in, day out, 24 seven. Get them up, strong and up, and their lives in victory before you put them into service. Too many are lost because 
the person who put them into service was careless and did not love them, did not love God enough to care for what matters most to him either. We must be deeply convinced that only God can accurately discern the motives of a heart. And since we can never know with certainty one's motives, we must not assume ourselves the role of being judge and jury that belongs to God alone. James 4, 11 through 12 says, don't criticize and speak evil about each other. And if you do, you're going to be fighting against God. We're to be loving one another and declaring what's wrong, but we do it in a way that builds. Your job is not to decide whether this law is right or wrong, but to obey it. That's the way our land works too, so it's not weird. Only the one who made the law can rightly judge among us, and he alone decides to save us or destroy us. So what right do we have to judge and criticize other people? We need to learn what to do when we're bothered by poor behavior of a Christian brother. Most people, well, we're all told to have accountability, to have those that we have around us that will hold us to, um, to the standard that we're to be holding. You don't jump in on someone else that you observe that you're, you have no business speaking into their life because you aren't one of the people that are holding them accountable. You know nothing about what's going on. We must pray for that person. If you want to do something about it, you pray for them, you go to God about them. You pray fervently and instantly because it's better to talk about, to God about it than to get caught talking to another about it. If we don't first take the log out of our own eye, he says, we're in no position to restore a fallen brother or sister. So stay out of something that isn't yours. Amen. We must learn to engage in clear, direct, face-to-face -face communication with other people, not fake smiles. We are not to call darkness light. We are not to repress our true feelings. We are to be clear, caring, constructive and communicate the same way. The goal is not to tear down by revealing hidden character flaws. It's repentance, reconciliation and restoration. That's God's language. That's his only language. And there's no guarantee people are going to respond the way God wants them to. Many don't, but give that to God and move along. Don't stay stuck in the ditch with them. If they don't wanna repent, move on. We need to be encouragers genuinely, building up others and helping them become all they can become, all that God longs for them to become. Get excited about building people up, not excited about tearing people down. If you're bent towards tearing people down, that's what excites you. You again need to examine which kingdom you are part of. That is not consistent with being a Jesus follower. Encouragement empowers, it's oxygen for the soul, Instead of seeing only the downside of those around us, pray for the ability to see what God is doing in their lives. Make a contribution if you must do something in furthering God's good work in the lives of others. Be an encourager, come alongside, build up, add strength, add joy, add. Don't tear down. Since many causes contribute to a critical spirit, the cures are varied also. And if the cause of a critical spirit is a lifestyle based on living by our sinful nature, we need to cultivate a new nature and learn to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell us where to go, what to do, and then you don't have to worry about what your evil nature wants to do because it doesn't even have a voice. Two, if it's the cause of a poor self-concept based on our works, we need to cultivate a healthy self-concept based on God's grace, nothing about our works. All of that is filthy to him. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. If the cause of the critical spirit is that we have experienced little or no grace from God, then we need to humble ourselves before God, confess, repent of our sins, which means turn from them, ask for his forgiveness, James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you have not, if you have unrepented sin in your life, you need to just never address someone else's because you're making things a lot worse for yourself. Just leave it alone. Leave it to somebody who's in obedience. If the cause of a critical spirit is insecurity due to um, a large measure of lack of self-acceptance or self-rejection, 
we need to learn to accept God's acceptance of us and find true security in what he thinks of us and has done for us because anything that we filter through there of our own beliefs and our own feelings is sinful. Romans 8 says that nothing can separate us from the love of God found in Jesus Christ our Lord. So don't let yourself create more nothing because it works against the kingdom. If the cause of a critical spirit is negative emotional focus or a negative worldview, then again, we need to switch kingdoms. We need to learn to see God's view of Jesus and not the worldly secular point of view. This is why dis discipleship is critical. If anybody is still sitting in the church, looking at the world through their own eyes, thinking that their life is up to them to make this choice, that choice, and the other choice, they have not been discipled because when you are discipled for Christ and you're following him, those choices belong to him. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Though we once regarded Christ from a worldly point of view, we do so no longer. He is King. He is Lord. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, that's what you're to be thinking on. If the cause of your critical spirit is immaturity, resulting from an improper faith focus, then you need to learn to focus on faith based on the atoning sacrifice of Christ and God's promises to us. The cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. That's it. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 says, Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader, our instructor, who was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew that would be his in the future. And now he sits in the place of honor by the throne of God. If you want to keep from becoming faint-hearted and weary, think about his patience with you, with me, with the sinful men who put him on that cross. Think of his patience. He did not defend himself. If the cause of the critical spirit is an unrenewed mind based on the world's ways of reacting, we need to submit ourselves to God, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I urge you in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's really nothing to add to that. That is what a follower of Jesus yearns to do. If the cause of the critical spirit is a root of bitterness due to a lack of forgiveness on our part, we need to forgive. Just as Jesus forgave us. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving just as Christ forgave you. If the critical spirit is the result of keeping unhealthy friends, we need to associate with those who have godly values and a positive attitude. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Don't let anyone deceive you. Associating with bad people will ruin decent people. If the cause of the critical spirit is the result of the devil negatively impacting your life, then you need to learn to resist the devil so that he cannot use you to discourage and hurt other people. James 4, 7 through 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If the devil is all around up in your business, you need to submit to God and resist the devil. The devil cannot touch you when you're with God. He can only touch what is stuck out of there for him to touch. Here's what godly constructive feedback looks like. Directly, face to face, and not through other people. It's serious and not flippant. It's for major offenses, not minor offenses that do not matter in eternity. Don't destroy someone over something so minor that in two weeks it won't even be any, an issue. Privately, it needs to be done one-on-one, -on -one, not in the presence of other people. So directly to their face and privately away from all others lovingly and with concern for the other's best interests, not with vengeance or returning what they gave you. Accurately and facts only, never based on gossip, something you're not sure of, inaccurate information, you just haven't checked it out, never. Sooner rather than later, not whenever you get to it. If you wanna stall this thing out and wait until you're ready, 
a lot of times the damage done just in your own soul is so great it probably won't come around in a good way. Another, it is directed towards behavior that the receiver can control and do something about, not something that they have absolutely no ability to control. Sometimes a family system involves so many people, a spouse cannot scream at a spouse over the way that their mother acts. That's completely out of bounds. Someone cannot control their parent or other people in the family. You set boundaries, but you don't blame someone who's not that person. Also, it is checked with the receiver in order to ensure clear, factual, and accurate communication. So make sure that when you've discussed this, that you've made sure they're okay, that things are okay, that things are clear, that it's been accurate in how they received it. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love, helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on. And the reason we come together as a church is not to criticize, it is to encourage one another. Cursing the darkness is not going to change anything. We must be lit candles. Ephesians 4.15 says we are to speak the truth in love and in doing so others will change for the better. Loving encouragement is a very motivational force. Most of us know that. We did not become better people, more loving people because somebody was criticizing us. If we ever hoped to help others, we need to learn to be an encourager. Encouragement helps others more than any critical spirit or judgmental attitude ever did. Ephesians 4.29 in the Amplified Bible says, Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome, nor worthless talk ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others, as is fitting to the need and the occasion, that it may be a blessing and give grace to those who hear it. Psychiatrist Dr. David H. Fink writes several things years ago, a psychiatrist wrote a magazine article, Release from Nervous Tension. In his article, he outlined his research into the causes of mental and emotional disturbances. From over 10,000 case studies, he discovered that there was a common trait with all of his patients who suffered from severe tension. They were habitual fault finders, constant critics of people and things around them. Those free of this tension were the least critical. The conclusion of this study is that fault finding is a prelude or a mark of the nervous or mentally unbalanced person. What's the bottom line here? Those who wish to retain good emotional, mental, and spiritual health should learn to completely be free from negative, critical, and judgmental attitudes. And Paul said the same many years earlier in Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God who makes everything work together for the good will work you into his most excellent harmonies. The Bible doesn't promise peace to those who dwell on the faults of others. It says, the Lord will keep them in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on him. Isaiah 26, 3. Precious Lord, all of us need your help with this. All of us are so weak when it comes to how we see and speak of other people. I ask you to forgive me for every single thing I have done or said that has been within this category and I ask you to bless a thousand times over those who I have cursed. I ask that you help us to live for an audience of one, that we truly walk this life out as if you are holding our hand that we don't go places, engage in conversations, do anything that we would not do if you were holding our hand. Help us to lock that in. Help us to truly strive to be like you. Especially in these final days, help us, Jesus, 
to be a flaming billboard for how good you really are. I ask you to help us all here to lead by example to those around us. Help us to serve well. We love the people you have connected us to and we ask that you would help us to be the very best examples of who you are to them as we can be. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.